Welcome to Backstage with Becca B with special guest Janine DeVita. Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Backstage with Becca B. On today's episode, this University of Michigan grad made her Broadway debut as Rizzo in Greece and has since been in shows like Young Frankenstein, Anything Goes, and If Then. Please welcome Janine DeVita. Thanks for joining me on this. <laughs> of course, I'm so sorry that I was running late today. It was like one thing led to another and I was like, okay, we just have to do six o'clock. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. I, Thank you for I, being, thanks for being flexible. Of course, of course. I, I mean, it's quarantine, so like. <laughs> I know, I, I feel like everybody's kind of like in flux with like, yeah, I'm gonna do this, but then things come up and I don't know, everyone just kind of makes it work, right? Yeah, so speaking of quarantine, first of all, how are you? <laughs> Good. I'm good. I'm, um, you know, staying busy and spending a lot of time at home and working on other projects and, um, yeah, just finding ways to pivot and innovate and all the stuff that you have to do when, you know, things get weird. <laughs> and things have been weird. <laughs> yeah. What about you? Uh, I mean, start, I started this cause I wanted to bring the conversation of theater back and I wanted to, uh, I mean, help people promote themselves even during yeah. this. Thank so, you so much for having me. Of course, I've heard nothing but great things about your performances. I've never gotten to see you on stage uh, before, one day. So, well, hopefully soon. I mean, as soon as the theater comes back, hopefully I'll be back doing that, so. Yes, hopefully. So anyways, I'll get into theater since this is a, since this interview show is about theater. Um, so. Uh, have you always known that you wanted to perform on stage and, and be an actress? So, um, I've always loved doing it, but in terms of wanting to do it as like my job, as a profession, no. Um, I've always loved it, um, but it wasn't until my senior year of high school where I decided that I was going to give it a shot and I was going to audition for musical theater programs, like for college. Um, and then once I got into Michigan, then it became like, a, okay, I'm here. I'm going to do this. I am going to give it my all. And then, um, you know, one thing led to another and I ended up, you know, making a career out of this. Um, but no, it wasn't something that like from the time I was like, 10 years old, I wanted to be on Broadway. It was just, I loved singing and I loved acting. Um, both my parents are attorneys, they're lawyers. So, I mean, the thought of becoming an actor for a living was like crazy. Um, so um, it, it, it was just something that I decided to take a chance on. And once I had the opportunity, I just ran with it. it so your parents were like, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they're they supportive of like, they're just, they're supportive of hard work. You know what yeah. I mean? And like, yeah. and to be an actor and to be successful in this business, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of, you know, late hours. It's a lot of, you know, challenging yourself. It's a lot of rejection. It's, a, you know, you really have to build up your resilience. And, um, you know, to them, it's like hard work. Like they respect hard work. So I, like I had that work ethic instilled in me from a very young age um in terms of it being a career you know i am very like I make it work kind of a person so i just i just made it work and it just you know you it's a it's a lifestyle too it's not just a profession like it's very much a lifestyle so you know you end up making the lifestyle work and sometimes the lifestyle doesn't work for everybody like you may love performing but you don't like the lifestyle and um in order to be a professional performer you really have to love the lifestyle or at least accept the lifestyle <laughs> And it's a lifestyle that takes some getting used to because it's like you're you're either in a job you either have a job or you don't exactly exactly it's very ebb and flow and it's not linear the way that a lot of other jobs are where it's like at a law firm for example like my parents are attorneys it's like you're an associate then you're a partner then you know what i mean like you move up the ladder um in in theater you know you could be starring in a broadway show one season then you're doing regional theater the next season then you're like a co-star on television then you're like on a national tour so it's very like all over the place and um i think that uh you know young actors need to know that that's a, that that is just what it is and that is success like to be a working actor is successful it's not 
like, yes, it's wonderful to be on Broadway, but at the same time, like if you're making a living as an actor and making a living as an artist and as an entertainer and in entertainment, I mean, it is so rare for that to happen. And it is so um, amazing when it does happen. Yes, and regional theater is such a beautiful thing. And I'm going to get into your long list of credits in a sec. But do you remember the first theater show you ever saw? Saw. The first theater show I ever saw was, I think it was Phantom of the Opera, the national tour that came through. Kansas City, I went to go see the national tour of Phantom of the Opera. And my dad walked around the house for like the next week going, why? Okay. Because <laughs> you're like, oh my. Because I was, because he, he like is not like a theater guy at all. And so he was like, he would walk around the house going, why? <laughs> so he likes theater now that I do it. But you know, yeah. back then he thought it was a little hokey. <laughs> I mean, Phantom of the Opera is such a good show. Oh, it's such a good show. I mean, it's iconic. Yeah. My dad has just a very dark sense of humor, so <laughs> that's just my dad. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go do this for a living, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's one, the, it's one of those shows you can't take your eyes off of, so that's a special show. You know what's funny? I actually um, hadn't seen the show since I was really little. I think when I saw it when I was like 10 years old, and... Um, I hadn't seen it again until like five years ago. I was actually auditioning for the national tour um, for Madame Giri. And I, and I had auditioned it for prior for Christine, but I'm a little long in the tooth now for that. But so now I'm in Madame Giri land. And, um, <laughs> and so I went to go see it. And honestly, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. And I also found myself watching the audience and it doesn't matter what language you speak, like everyone was entranced by it. And that to me is so beautiful. I love, I mean, I love watching theater, but I also love watching the audience watch theater. And um, I was really moved to tears watching the audience watch it because it was just a really beautiful thing to see everybody connecting to the music and the story and and how it just transcends any language barriers or anything i just thought it was a really beautiful thing and it's so beautifully directed yes no it is it definitely is and then also you mentioned that you uh went to university of michigan I did. So, what was your experience there like i saw that you um majored in t in two things I did. I double majored. I was a crazy person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I double majored in musical theater and communications. So um, I took the maximum amount of credits every semester and I would um, take summer classes and then I would uh, basically try to check off as many boxes as I could by crossing over the classes, you know, like they would, yeah. like they would check requirements for certain schools and things. So I was very strategic in like which classes I took so that I would be able to meet all the requirements. Um, I loved University of Michigan. I loved it. It was like the most amazing college experience and the musical theater program is awesome because they really just like let you be you and they're not trying to make you into anything else and they really help you blossom. And you're so young. I mean, when you look back at it, I mean, the time you're 18 to 22 years old, like you are a child. And so it's really hard to say, like, they helped me grow into myself, but they really did. And they set me up for, you know, a really great career. And they set me up for a great network of people yeah. to, to work with and to get to know with the alumni connections and everything. Um, and I think the training is really good. They really teach, they teach professionalism. They, they instill a work ethic in you and a respect for the craft and a respect for the history of theater that um, I think is really important to have when you're embarking on this career. And I, I feel like it's not one of those schools that people would like think, oh, it has like a really good theater program, but it does. And like, so I know successful people. Have well, it's so it. funny. I didn't think, I didn't know about it at all when I auditioned. The only reason I auditioned there was because a girl that I grew up with, Leslie Frankel, went there and I always looked up to her. 
and I thought that she was super talented. And so I was like, oh, Leslie Frankel went there? Well, it must be good. Okay. And then my voice teacher was like, yeah, Janine, it's like one of the top musical theater programs. And I, I didn't know anything because all I did was community theater. Like I didn't go to any of these fancy camps. I didn't do any of these fancy things that you kids have now. I didn't have any of that. Yeah. And um, so I, it was all just word of mouth at that point for me. So I just decided to audition and that's how it happened. But yeah, I mean, I, it's funny because it's such a great school academically, but then it also has this great musical theater program, um, which I think, I mean, first you have to get in academically first before you even can apply for the musical theater program. So like it, it I feel like it attracts people who have like an academia kind of brain, like a work ethic kind of brain. And I think that that's a big reason why people want to work with Michigan graduates because we have this like like kind of nerdy brainy side to us and it's funny whenever I meet a Michigan grad it's like oh, okay I get you yeah because we're yeah. all kind of nerds you know yeah for sure <laughs> yeah and like then, in the best way possible <laughs> yeah I mean nerds are great so nerds are the best theater, theater nerds are great because you can just talk with theater about them like all day exactly it's exactly fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> and then um, what's the most valuable lesson you learned while attending school at Michigan? My best valuable, hmm, I think it's, um, like, I think it's that you are, your uniqueness is what will sell you. Your uniqueness is what makes you marketable and makes you different um and that you should not shy away from your uniqueness and your instincts like your instincts are so special and i think that um and you know mark madama whenever you would kill an instinct he would say it's like killing a baby because because your instincts are so special and your instincts that's what that's what art is it's act it's acting on instinct and acting on like your own energy and your own view of the world and your point of view and everything and um i think that the biggest lesson i learned there was to honor your instincts and to not second guess your instincts yeah yeah I, and second guessing is a big thing i feel like for performers especially yeah it, yep and you know what fortune favors fortune favors the brave like that song and Aida, it's true. Fortune favors the brave. You just have to be brave and be bold, like strong and wrong, but at least you're making a choice. <laughs> go for stuff. Yep, just go for it. And then you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, regional theater and Broadway. Um, yeah. And you have a long list of regional credits and mm -hmm. New York credits that like aren't Broadway and yeah. aren't tours. How did you, how, how do you consistently find projects to work on in the theater industry? That's a great question. Um, so I booked my first Broadway show, like I wasn't even a year out of school. So yeah, so it happened really quickly for me, which is very rare um, and it's a, it's a fluke. Like it, people should not put that kind of pressure on themselves because it's very rare that that happens, but it happened for me and um, I'm very grateful that it did, but it opened up a lot of doors for me because I all of a sudden had this great Broadway credit. And a lot of times regional theaters and, and casting directors and stuff, um, your eight, so I have an agent and a manager and basically they get the breakdowns from the casting directors and they see what casting directors are looking for and they'll do what's called a submission. So they'll submit me for an audition. So you're actually, you're like kind of auditioning for the audition in the submission. So like they'll, the casting directors are the gatekeepers and they'll look at your resume and your headshot and they'll, you know, kind of weed out the people who they think are right for something and not right for something. Um, and, you know, I had this great Broadway credit. So a lot of people wanted to see me for things. Okay. So that's how I started getting auditions for all this stuff. I mean, I, I, I got auditions when I moved to the city because I was new there. And, and I, I found that casting directors are very curious about new talent. And so they want to, they want to meet new talents. So if you're new in New York and you're starting out, like run with it, use it because the, everybody is curious about new talent. And so when I was new here, I would get seen for things. But then once I booked my Broadway show, I feel like it upped the ante in terms of me being seen for projects. And, um, and I was lucky enough to then get cast, you know, in wonderful roles around the country to build my resume. Um, 
and, and uh, you know, play these awesome roles at these different regional theaters. And then, you know, a lot of times it becomes scheduling issues too, you know, where it's like, okay, I'm booked for this amount of time. And then, you know, you're auditioning for the next job, like as your contract is ending, hoping you have something else lined up. But sometimes there's like a two, three month period where you're not working and you're like, am I ever going to work again? And then you'll book something and then you'll, you know, you go on to the next, to the next job. Um, but it's all through your agent and it's all through, it was all through, it's all through my agent. And it's all through my manager and how I get those auditions. Um, now, since I've been around for a while, like sometimes I'll just get a phone call, you know, asking me if I can do something, um, you know, especially developmental projects and things like that. So, so that's very nice. Um, but you know, it does, it does help to have, I think the resume, um, to help get you into the door for those things. But again, I say, if you're new, it doesn't matter. And, and if, you're, if you're just trying to get people's interest peaked, um, you know, people are always curious about learning about new talent. So that's a great, if you're new, if you, you know, if you just got a new headshot, if you have a new credit on your resume, all of that stuff, all that new news, is really a great way, I think, to to get the attention of a casting director um, if you're right for a project. It's like one of the misconceptions too when you're auditioning. I feel like is that like, oh, like they're like they know who they want to cast. It's like or something like that. Or uh, yeah, sometimes they have no idea. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, and the casting director, you know, interprets the 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 creative team's ideas as best as they can, you know? Um, but sometimes in the room, ideas will change. Yeah. And like maybe the casting director will like throw in a wild card and that's the person that they end up choosing, which was totally against the type that they thought that they wanted, you know? Cause it's art, it's all subjective and it's all about who, what you bring to it. So like you might walk in for one role and they actually are like, huh, can you actually read for this instead? And they'll give you the sides for something else and then you'll end up getting that part. You know, that's happened to me before. And so, um, yeah, it's, it, it's so much about the energy in the room. And you're right, they sometimes don't know exactly what they want. That's what the creative process is. They're putting all these puzzle pieces together and they want you to be it. That's the yeah. thing I, I, I wanna tell everybody. It's like, no one is wishing you to fail. Everybody wants you to succeed. They, they are giving you all the good juju, all the good juju when you walk in. Do you have any audition tips to like calm your nerves pre-auditions? Um, yes. Um, and it's just play the part. That's just play the role. Like don't think about it as an audition. Don't think about it as, think about it as your first day of rehearsal. That's what it's rehearsal. <laughs> yeah, it's it's rehearsal. It's your first day of you already have the job, and you are going in there. And it's in, and I'm also really big about using your imagination to create the world of the play because it always helps me to feel like I'm transported from an audition room with fluorescent lighting and people behind the, the table and all that stuff. So I really try to imagine how I can use the audition room. There have been times I've even actually, if it's at an audition place that I don't know, like if it's at a studio that I don't know, I sometimes will go in advance just to like see the room. That's smart. Because I want to be able, I, I just, I want to see what it is so that I can imagine the space as the world is in my head. And um, so I've done that before where I'll, I'll actually take a field trip <laughs> and I'll be like, and I'll be like, huh, okay. So if the table's face this way, I'll like map it out. You know what I mean? Because it helps yeah. calm me to, to like have as much control over the things that I can, you know? And I feel like my, imag I love using my imagination. And so it, I will just imagine all the different possibilities and it helps calm me and it gives me a sense of security. Did you ever like uh, perform for your parents as a child? Because that makes me like think back to my sisters and I performing and using our imaginations. To, like, I mean, I did, I did up until I became self-conscious. I don't know about you, but like, <laughs> yeah, I did up until like 11. Yeah. It's, it's like I, all of a sudden at 11, I became like really self-conscious and I never wanted to sing in front of my parents ever. 
But up until that point, yeah, I would put on shows in the garage with my aunts and uncles and my cousins to like the Beastie Boys soundtrack. I would always put on plays on the playground. I would like be the director, but also the star. And um, <laughs> yeah, but, but, uh, but then all of a sudden, like at like age 11, I became really self-conscious. And if anybody asked me to sing and I wasn't like on the stage, I'd be like, no like really yeah. shy, I became like super shy about doing it unless I was like, unless it was like in a setting that was meant to be, I was meant to be singing in. Yeah, that yeah. I mean, makes sense, makes sense. Cause yeah. that's, about, that's about the stage where it could start getting to, into the overthinking anxiety. Portion. Exactly, exactly. I definitely went through that phase. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I had to know because the imagination part, I was like, oh my gosh, you probably performed like I did. Costumes. Oh, I did. I totally did. Well, but I, it, but costumes. It, oh, totally. Costumes. I loved playing dress up. It was always that. I mean, oh, I was always singing. But yeah, that was when I was like little. When I became like a preteen, you know, I went through that whole like awkward phase and, you know. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, we think we're more awkward than we are. But <laughs> well, totally. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, my cousin's going through it right now, and I'm like, that's fine. You'll get over it'll it. Pa it'll pass. It'll pass. It'll pass. We'll get through it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, um, before I get into Broadway, what was your favorite show that you've done so far that hasn't been Broadway or a national tour? Hmm. I would have to say, most recently, it was the Bridges of Madison County. I, Ooh. Yeah, I played Francesca last summer. And it was just like, it's just, that role is such a dream. The score is a dream to sing. Um, the journey she goes through, it's so cathartic. Uh, it was just awesome. I'm also Italian. And so it was really awesome to like, you know, feel my ancestors and feel my, that music and through that story. Like, it was just um, a really, like, really wonderful, like human art experience. Yeah, that, no, that sounds awesome. And how many, uh, how many uh, theaters or how many cities have you performed in? Because you've done so much, as I mentioned, regional theater. So, oh my gosh, hundreds. It, it's like honestly, you know, I would, I like, think, I think it's like in the hundreds. Getting your name out all over the country. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, because of all the touring I've done. Yeah, it's 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 got to be hundreds. That's crazy. I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot yeah. when you think about it. Cause yeah, it's gotta be with like all the, and all the concert gigs I've done too. Yeah. It's gotta be hundreds. Yeah. That's crazy. Like, that, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot. Not bad for a girl from Kansas city. Right. <laughs> Impressive. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Honestly, <laughs> bragging rights there. <laughs> Ah, you didn't even think about that. Wow, that's a great question. I actually should tally it up and see how yeah. it is. Because, I mean, the first thing I noticed when I looked at your resume was like, wow, it's long. Yeah, I have worked a lot. I've been really fortunate to work a lot. I've been really busy. Um, I'm just, I, I'm just a curious gal and I just like to play different roles. And, you know, it, luckily I've had opportunities to do it. So why not, right? Yeah. Exactly. What you love. Yeah. And then um, you um, made your Broadway debut in 2007? 2008. 2008. Okay. Yeah. So, so a long time ago. Um, I played Rizzo in Greece. Okay. And yeah. what was it like uh, making your Broadway debut as such like an iconic character that everyone knows? It was awesome. Like, hands down, awesome. Um, I was really wanting it to be perfect. I just remember that. Like I wanted it to be perfect. I think now I'm a little less about perfection, but back then I was wanting it to just be perfect. Yeah. And, um, but I found that role super um, freeing and empowering. And I learned a lot about myself, like as a, as a young woman, like I learned a lot about like the power I can have and the influence that I can have because this character, she's so defiant. I mean, she's inside very damaged, of course, but she's so bold. 
And I really enjoyed playing such a bold character. I really, really dug that. And I think it really informed a lot of like how I then moved forward in my career. It gave me a lot of confidence. Um, it was really cool. And it was really cool too, because Riz, everybody loves the character Rizzo. And so it was really cool that, you know, she was so beloved by so, by love by, so, beloved by so many people. And then like, I got to play that role. It was really like, just really cool. Then I got to meet Stalker Channing. Like it was just, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, she's such a three-dimensional character, honestly. Yeah, and yeah, I think it's just she's just a great she's a great role, and there's so much history too. Like, I'm really big into like the history of the time period of like influences that characters are going through, and like what what informs their choices and stuff. And so, um, I read this really great book written by one of my professors at Michigan, one of my communications professors. So I took this really great studies about women in the media. And this, um, this one book she wrote is called Where the Boys Are. And it's all about the media from the 50s into the 60s. And it was so interesting to read and apply all of that because all of the music that they were listening to, because there was a really big shift in music um, in between the 50s and the 60s, a really yeah. big shift and how that was informing um, you know, the choices that Rizzo was making, like what, was she, what were her influences, you know, all that kind of stuff, like rock and roll was coming in and all that. So um, yeah, it was a really cool experience. Really, really cool. And speaking of choices, how did you make the character of Rizzo your own? Hmm. I think for me, um, Rizzo has a lot of like deep seated sadness and that turns into like anger and that turns into defensiveness. And I relate to that a lot um, in terms of just, you know, my parents are divorced and it was really, really hard. And I, I carried, I think a lot of sadness, which turned into anger, which turned into defensiveness in my own life. And so I drew upon that. Um, I drew upon, uh, you know, my own experiences of coping in maybe unhealthy ways. Uh, and you know, that feeling of, you know, um, putting your guard up, but then when you're faced with something that breaks your heart, like you're vulnerable. So, uh, it's, I, I drew upon a lot of like my own, like teenage angst, like middle school angst and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um. So that's, that's how I kind of personalized it, just because I related to that. And I think it's a really relatable um, character because a lot of girls go through that like rebellious stage um, because they aren't coping in like the, maybe in a healthy way with, you know, family trauma and stuff like that. So that's, that's how I approached it. And I mean, high school is a tough time for everyone. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But she's also like really fun. But like her sarc, like sar her sarcasm comes from a place. Like it's a defense yeah. mechanism. Yeah. So oh, like sarcasm yeah. is a defense mechanism. So for me, it's like everything she did was to cover this like broken heart. Yeah. You know. And she covers it until the second half of the show. Exactly. Well. Exactly. Do you remember the day you first made your you made your Broadway debut? <laughs> It's kind of a blur. Um, I will say that I didn't invite anyone to my Broadway debut um, because I wanted it to be perfect. And I wanted to just get it out of the way and then people can come the next week. But I didn't want the added pressure of people being there. I was just like, I just want to get it done. I just want to do it, you know, and then be done with it. But my roommate she insisted on coming. She's like, you're not making your Broadway debut, Janine, and no one's going to be there for you. And so my roommate came, Alex Brock, and she's amazing. She's a great friend. Um, we've lost touch, but I just think the world of her. And so she uh, surprised me at my opening night. I didn't know she was coming. <laughs> but really, I, I just wanted it to be, I wanted it to be so perfect that I didn't um, celebrate it, I think, in the way that I should have. You know, it should have been more of a celebration, but I was so like, okay, I have this opportunity. It's got to be perfect. You know, I didn't want to mess it up. Huh? <laughs> You were too tough on yourself at the time. I was very tough on myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a lot more chill now, but but back then I was really tough on myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's the perfectionist side of performance. Very perfectionist. Yes. <laughs> like, if you, like you think you messed up on maybe like one millisecond of something and you're like, 
oh, that was terrible. I messed up on one millisecond. And, and the audience members are like, what? Oh yeah, I still remember. I still remember that I almost forgot a line and Lindsay Mendez, I think, nudged me to like get me to like say my line. It was my, it was my Broadway debut. I think I forgot a line and she like nudged me and I was like, and so I said my line, but I'll never forget it because um, I just remember that feeling of fear of like, oh God, it's me, you know? But I, I do remember that though. <laughs> I, doubt, I doubt people noticed. Oh, I'm sure it was like, a, it was like, no, I'm sure nobody noticed. But to this day, <laughs> all these years later, I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, remember that time I probably debut when I did? <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh no. <laughs> it's like PTSD. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, reformer things, for sure. <laughs> reformer things, yes. <laughs> I'm, I <laughs> from so many people. <laughs> yep, yep. That kind of stuff, where they're like, I judge myself so, so hard. Oh, totally. And then, uh, after playing Rizzo, you went on to play, you went on to be in uh, Young Frankenstein, Anything Goes, and yeah. Young Frankenstein tour. I did the national tour of Young Frankenstein next. I mean, I did regional theater in between those two contracts. Yeah. Um, I did three, three or four regional gigs in between that. And then um, did Young Frankenstein and then did some more regional stuff. And then I did Anything Goes on Broadway. And then I did some more regional stuff. And then I did Drood on Broadway. And then I did some original stuff and TV stuff. That's when I started doing television, was after Drood in 2014. And then I did uh, If Then. Yeah. And then I did, and then I got married, did some original stuff. And then I did Finding Neverland. That's it, that's the order, woo -hoo! Yeah, it barely took breaks, apparently. <laughs> Uh, no, I really didn't. I, I really like, I've been really lucky that like, I've been able to make a living just performing and um, get my health insurance just performing. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been crazy. <laughs> what was your first time like on a tour like? Was it with Young Frankenstein that the first It was. It was, it was with Young Frankenstein. That was also when I was a crazy person perfectionist. So I, <laughs> I, I was like, I, I like never went out. I was like a nun in my room. Oh no. I know, I know. Um, and I, uh, but it was really, I had so much fun on that tour though, because it was such a great comedy. Like I just like laughed so hard like there would be times when i'd have to turn up stage because corey english who plays igor he uh, he would make me laugh like he would like <laughs> fart on he would like fart on stage or something and i would like I, I would have to like turn i would have to turn up stage because i just like could I, are you kidding me <laughs> was, he is so funny um it was really like such a fun show and i had such glamorous costumes and um it was such a cushy role too like it was such a princess part like i was in like the opening number and then i had like the whole act the whole first act doing nothing and then i came in at the top of act two going it's me like it was literally the cushiest job it was great and um i mean what was your favorite city on the tour and in Frankenstein? Um, How many cities did you go to for that tour? Like, a lot? 30? Wow. I don't know. <laughs> a ton? We would spend like a week or two in each city. Yeah. Um, and I did it for a year. So, that's a lot. Um, let's see. Uh, my favorite city on Young Frankenstein. Um, I really enjoyed Fort Lauderdale, actually. That was a great city to go to in, in Orlando. Oh, and I loved Greenville, South Carolina randomly, but Greenville, Ooh. South Carolina is really, really pretty. See, I love the random cities that like people, like you're not expecting people to say them and they're like, yeah. okay, interesting. Greenville's very, very pretty. I really enjoy Greenville on, in Young Frankenstein. Yeah. And also, um, yeah, th those, I think that's my favorite. I mean, I, I mean, I loved being in California. We were in California. So, like, that was That's really mother. cool. 
The weather there is great. Yeah, it was great. Where are you? Uh, well, right now I'm in Dallas, but I normally live in uh, Los Angeles. Studio oh, okay. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, I really dug the California weather. That was great. Yeah, it's amazing. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> year round, except for December, January-ish. Well, it's better than a, the New England weather. It's freezing. Yeah, yeah. Better than, better than that. But, <laughs> and then uh, you went back on tour in 2015 with If Then. So did you learn anything specifically like from Young Frankenstein tour that helped you the second time, the next time yes, you went on tour? Absolutely. I told myself that I was going to be productive during the day rather than sleeping till 11, going to the gym, going to get food and then doing the show. Because there, it's so easy on tour to just get in that cycle of like just doing the show. And I, I didn't want to do that anymore. I, did, I wanted to like be productive during the day. Of course you need to rest. Of course you need to rest and be okay for the show and be, you know, you have to have your instrument ready. Um, but I wanted to create while I was on tour. That was my, I was like, I'm going to have all this time in these cities where I don't know anyone, um, all these random cities. I have to create work. I have to create art while I'm on tour. And that was something I did learn. And I also learned that, um, traveling with a skillet is kind of a pain in the butt. Um, <laughs> so I traveled with a skillet when I was on Young Frankenstein. And for if then I was like, I'm not traveling with a skillet. I'm just going to find a Starbucks and eat those egg bites. And that's what I did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, but I decided I really was like very adamant and I, and I stuck to it. I created a lot of things while I was on tour. Um, a lot of things that are now, you know, coming to fruition because I've kept with them since the tour. So um, if then was a very transformative experience for me. Um, every night was about choice and chance and life and the different directions life can take you and so every night was a really good meditation on me for seizing the day and seizing opportunity and so every day i would wake up and it was really a beautiful thing i really would wake up every day and i would work on creating something new and that was something that um that was something that was very different than my if than my young frankenstein experience i was also older so it also like done more so you know i had let go of kind of like all of the perfectionism stuff i mean i'm still very much like a perfectionist but i had let go of of the paralyzing perfection perfectionism that um would keep me in my room you know it's for fear yeah. of like losing my voice or something you know um so i let go of that a lot in the if then tour it's just so i could like be a human you know yeah and i was gonna say uh you kind of mentioned the storyline of If Then, and the storyline of If Then is so, like, it, it's just so good. Yeah. And very, like, it gives the audience a lot to think about. Uh, why, like, it was so underrated, and did you ever see If Then before getting cast in it? And if so, like, were you like, I have to be in the show? Um, I never saw it before. Um, I didn't know anything about it, really. Um, I had audition. Uh, so I auditioned to be the standby for Elizabeth, for Adina, okay? And I ended up not getting it. My friend Jackie got it. And um, so I was in Michael's mind. And then we ended up doing um, a workshop together of a walk on the moon, um, which, and Michael's, Michael's not the director of it anymore. It's a new director. Um, so I'm not with the project anymore. I was only with it with Michael. Um, and then um, when If Then came along for the tour, they asked if I would audition for Anne. Okay. And so, because they remembered me from um, the times before. Um, that I'd worked with Michael. So Michael remembered me from the times before. I love Michael Greif. And um, so then I auditioned for Anne and it was also to cover Edina. They weren't having a standby. So they were making Anne the first cover. So Anne is a principal role, usually played by Jen Colella, 
So I played Anne on the If Then tour, but I also was the first cover for Adina. So I went on for Adina every Tuesday. So, um, so that's what was going on with that tour. So um, I wasn't familiar with the show, but I was familiar with the music and the role. And I actually was out of town doing another job anyway while If Then was running. Um, so I wasn't able to see it. Um, but I was able to um, then revisit all the material when the tour came around. Wow, so you were essentially on the tour playing, uh, like switching roles every now yeah. and then. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot, it was a lot. But it yeah. was a, it, like, it was, I just, I just love the show so much. Like, um, I just, I just really loved that show. And it got mixed reviews here in the city. Um, and uh, I, and I, I'm really glad that they toured it because I feel like it got a really great response going around the country. And it's such a great message that I'm just really glad that we were able to share it with the country. I feel like it's one of those shows, like seeing shows twice is like a must for me or seeing shows more than once is like a must for me. And I feel like it's one of those shows that like, if you see it, like, like you need to maybe see it multiple times to get the whole storyline. And then you're like, whoa. This whoa, is absolutely. It's so nuanced and it's so layered. Um, and yeah, I mean, I there were people who were, um, big fans of If Then and they would come see it multiple times and each time they would say they get something else out of it because it's that layered. It's such a layered show. Yeah. And the music is fantastic. So good. It's like, I'm obsessed. Oh my God, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of those shows that needs to be revived. Like I do too. I, I don't do know if too. it's too soon, but <laughs> no, no, no. Preach. I want to, I would do it in a heartbeat. Like just, just throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, can you talk a little about your experience with Anything Goes? You were, you understudied in that show? I know mm -hmm. it's going backwards a bit, but. No, that's okay. Um, yeah, so Anything Goes, oh my gosh. Um, I, I have loved that show for forever, and I got the audition, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of dancing. And, and I dance, but I'm by no means like a dancer. I can dance. And I did dance in that show and I worked my butt off to learn it all. Um, and thank goodness I have a little, um, I have a little bootleg of it. I'm really excited because it, it's just from, it's from the spot operator, but I have a couple of little short bootlegs of me doing Blow Gabriel Blow and um, uh, Anything Goes, the tap number. So when I went on, when I went on, when I went on, when I went on for Reno. Um, so, I mean, it was just, it was a lot of like practicing nonstop. Like I would just practice all the time during, like when I was like, I was in the ensemble and when I wasn't on stage performing, I was literally like in the hallway practicing. <laughs> like I was always practicing, always practicing because it, 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 it's so much dancing. And because dancing isn't my first language with musical theater, like singing and acting are my first two languages. Dance is my second, my third, I mean. Um, it's it's not something that just comes so easily to me. So I just practice my butt off. Yeah. 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 I just practice, <laughs> practice, practiced. That's all I did. <laughs> and I, I, I'm going to uh, repeat the tour question that I asked earlier, but did you learn anything the first time on Broadway that like you could, uh, that helped you your with this time on Broadway. Um, yeah, um, I was way more chill. Like I was, <laughs> I, mean, I was way more chill about um, getting the job. You know what I mean? It was like, oh great, I got another gig. It wasn't the same. Like I'm on Broadway. It wasn't that. It was like awesome. I got another job. Amazing. You know. So that was different. Cause I had like done you know, I'd had some things under my belt at that point. So it was more like, awesome. I'm, I'm really happy to join this cast. Um, and I think also it was, a, uh, I didn't have time to get excited about it or anything like that because it was, I knew I had so much work to do. You know, I just knew I had so much work to do. So really it was just like a, it was like a get down to business kind of a thing. Um, and, uh, in my Broadway, in my debut in that one, I just, did the show and went home. Like it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> um, like, like, I, it, it was like, I, I, it was just my first night in it. And I met up with a friend and like afterwards, that's it. It wasn't like a really big deal for, I mean, it was a, it's a big deal. Don't get me wrong. You're on Broadway again, but 
um, it was like, great, I have another job. Yeah, you were like, like more, more chill. Way more chill about it, way more chill. <laughs> hey, that, that's great though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like growth, amazing. <laughs> yes, we love that. And like, you can still be a perfectionist in a, in a like stance, but like, it's like to be a little more like, don't be so tough on yourself. Exactly, it was like, cool, awesome, did it, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you could revive any show that you've been in, besides I'm gonna say if then, what show would you revive? Hmm. Definitely if then. Um, <laughs> you're gonna hit Bridges of Madison County. I just love it so much. <laughs> I just love it. I just think yes. it's just the most beautiful show. I've I never just love seen it. I've either because like I don't live in New York, so like I know. I, I mean that's one of the unfortunate things, but like LA regional theater is really good. But yeah, I think, um, yeah, Bridges, I, uh, I also really loved, um, Grey Gardens. Oh, okay. I loved Grey Gardens and Sunday in the Park with George. I loved that too. I've heard some Sunday in the Park with George revival. Yeah. It's so good. It's so yeah. good. People have answered with that. <laughs> <laughs> and then what's your dream role? Ooh, people ask me that a lot. Um, so many to choose from. I don't know. I um, I would love to play the baker's wife in Into the Woods. Ooh, yes. <laughs> That's a great one. Um, and I think as I get older, Big Edie in Grey Gardens and something original. Okay, yes. It's definitely something original. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Also, also Mother Mother in Ragtime is also one I would love to play. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Would love that. Yeah. And then if you could work uh, with any other actor or actress in a show, Ooh. no matter what show it is, who would it be? That's a good one. I, so I would love to work with Brian Darcy James. Oh, yeah. I think he is just such a terrific, smart, in the moment actor. Um, and I actually got my, my equity card working with him when I was a sophomore in college in Anything Go, sorry, in um, Annie Get Your Gun. And um, uh, I was in the ensemble, I was in college at the Muni. And I, yeah, I joined the union that, that summer, which was really, really cool. Um, and, uh, and I doubt he remembers me, <laughs> but, uh, but I would love to. But I would love to work with him. I think that he, I, I just, I just think the world of him and I love how he's transitioned to on camera work. And I think he's just so excellent on camera. Um, and that's a really tough transition sometimes for stage actors to do. And I, I've made the transition myself too. And so I just like really respect his transition and how he's really just run with it and just play these really just like these real characters. Like he's just, I just, I think he's just so three dimensional and I just really enjoy watching him. Um, and uh, for an actress, I'd really love to work with Alice Ripley. Oh, yeah. Another yeah, I did a concert with her, and I just think that she's so um, intuitive and uh, spontaneous and um, sensitive. Yeah. I would just really like to work with her. Yeah, and I mean, next to normal. Jeez. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Amazing. Yeah, I would love to like play her sister or something. <laughs> yes. In some, I don't know. I don't know what could be written for us, but I would, just, I, would, I would just love to play her sister in something. You'll huh? both originate roles in the same show. Exactly. We'll just play sisters. I really, I feel like, I feel like we could be great sisters. Yeah. <laughs> it, I'll, I'll come see you on stage in that because I need to see you on stage. Yes. So. It's like, it's like Alice Ripley and Julia Murney to me are like, I would just love to play like their sisters in something. <laughs> Like I have people who I want to ca to be cast as my sisters. Exactly. Please. Like, can we just please ca play? Please do a sister thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then um, you mentioned transitioning into a TV film. How have you or how have you been able to uh, do that? And like, what have you learned through transitioning into TV and film? Mm -hmm. Um. 
I mean, maybe transitioning is the wrong word. Expanding, expanding okay. into. Yeah, we're expanding. So I haven't. I mean, I'm not leaving the theater behind by any means. Yeah. Um, I'm, I've expanded into television and film. Um, how it how it happened was just auditioning. You know, um, I booked my first feature film opposite Josh Lucas and Dustin Hoffman uh, back in 2014. It's called Hear My Song. It's really big in Asia. It was supposed to be <laughs> really big here. And then there is a scandal that happened with like the subject matter. And so it never aired, which is so weird. Um, but uh, it was a beautiful experience. And um, so that was back in 2014. And since then I've been, you know, working, you know, throughout the year on different projects, throughout the years on different projects. Um, the biggest transition I think the biggest shift for an actor, for, for a stage actor, is that um, it is very much about what you're feeling. It's less about the other person. I think um, for stage acting, it's all about um, the other person and, and making sure that you're listening and active listening and all that kind of stuff um, with on camera, because it's such a visual medium, like they really, the camera needs to see what you're going through. The camera needs to see your journey and your inner thoughts um, and and that's okay so it's okay to feel selfish on camera um, and that was the biggest shift for me because I never wanted to feel to be self-indulgent as an actor I never wanted to feel self-indulgent um, and on camera you really can be I mean you're active of course but it really is about the character that you're your character it's about you yeah. What was the most shocking difference for you between uh, TV and stage acting? Or I think it was that. I think it was that where um, uh, you really don't have to do a lot besides be honest in the moment. Like there's not, I mean, you have, I mean, I, I think also, I think what was, was also the biggest shock for me is my stage training actually came into came in handy a lot because um, you have to hit marks when you're on set. Okay, so like you have to hit these marks, and you also have to, for continuity, you have to do the same thing over and over again for editing purposes. Okay, so my memory as a stage actor, I think, is really trained for that. My That's memory. Yeah, my memory is trained for blocking. My memory is trained, my brain is trained for hitting my marks. My brain is, is, is trained for doing eight shows a week, you know? So like the same thing eight, eight times a week. So like um, once I get blocking directions, like, okay, got it. Yeah. You know, so I think I was um, pleasantly surprised that my acting training on stage really did come in handy because I'm, I'm not afraid of using the space. I'm not afraid of using a prop. I'm not afraid of, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's really interesting because like the members, like I've never thought about the memorization part transition, like. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Cause you're having to, cause like, for example, when I was shooting the deuce, um, you know, just the order in which, like, I pick up the newspaper, put my coffee down, put the paper down, sip my coffee. Yeah. And, like, fun. that order has to be repeated every take. Yeah. You know, or it's going to, I mean, it doesn't have to be, but, the, like, the editor will thank you later. Um, because for continuity purposes, you know, like, it needs to be, the, the motion needs to be the same um, so that it's, you know, continuous as they're editing and even for the editors that maybe aren't as picky it's like I mean I have an editor brain because I have done some editing <laughs> so it's like I'm that person who's watching tv and I'll be like the continuity is missing there yes yes and as like as a considerate actor you want to like honor the continuity as much as you can to make the editing process as smooth as possible yeah, and you don't want to like leave something on the table that wasn't there. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Also, also, um, memorization. I mean, I'm I'm really glad that you know I have to memorize so much so much material as often as I do because you know you'll get a different script that day. Yeah, you know, or you know what I mean, and you're just like, okay, this is different, but okay, yeah. You know? <laughs> and then kind of uh, to wrap 
up, kind of starting to wrap up. Uh, since you did both TV and fil uh, TV film and uh, stage acting now, I mean, you've got to have a lot of self-confidence with auditioning and stuff. How do you work on self-confidence? Um, I think the biggest thing is what's meant for you is going to be for you. It doesn't matter. It, it, there's really nothing you can do wrong if the role is meant for you. I think that that's the biggest thing. It's like, and I know it's kind of like focus, focus sounding or whatever, but, but I really do feel like if, if you walk in the room and you're what they want, there's nothing you can do that will make you not get that part. That will, yeah. So you just have to walk in there and put your best foot forward. You have nothing to lose. So just put your, like you have nothing to lose. So just put your best foot forward, do your best and then let it go because if it's meant for you, it's going to be yours. And, you know, rejection is protection. So, you know, that's a big thing too. It, if it, was, it, it might not have been good for you. It might have, you know, whatever doesn't happen wasn't meant to happen for whatever reason. So yeah. with self-confidence, it's like go in there with that confidence, knowing that if it's meant for you, it's, it's yours. And go in there like you already own the part. Just go play the part. Your job is not to audition. Your job is to play the part. Your job is to act. Yeah. So go act. And something else might come along that's better than exactly what you originally planned. Than like the role that maybe you really wanted but you didn't get. Exactly. And a year from now, you'll look back and be like, "Oh, I get it." Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm so I'm so glad I didn't get that so I could do this. Exactly. And then what's the funniest thing that's ever happened to you on stage? <laughs> Well, besides Corey English farting during is Young Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the funniest thing that has happened to me? Oh my God. So many funny things. I, don't even... I feel like there was one thing where like my top fell down or something. Oh, well, during, during, um, if then we, there was, there was so much scaffolding. I don't know if you remember the yeah. set at all, but there's so much scaffolding and man, oh man, I would trip up those stairs. <gasps> like, I think I tripped up those stairs probably four times during that run, just like going up the stairs and being like, <laughs> like down. <laughs> Like, I'm so klutzy. Like, look, I even have a broken toe right now. Like, I'm so klutzy. <laughs> I ran into the door frame. I ran into the door frame of my bathroom. Okay. So klutzy. So <laughs> how many people do you interview who have a broken toe? I mean, not many people who run into door frames of bathrooms. Wait, this is a really good screenshot. Will you take a screenshot? This is a really good that, that could be like the, uh, what I use for you too. <laughs> wait, wait, I'm going to do a screenshot. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait take one. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! god. I mean, seriously, I think I think that um that was the, that was probably the funniest thing because it just happened so often. It's like I do it, and then like a few months would go by, and then I would trip up again. So it's like, why? <laughs> did you have to wear heels when climbing? Yes, the I did have to wear okay. heels. I was wearing like high heeled boots, so that is probably something to do with it. But um, just kind of a klutz. Yeah, like <laughs> I mean, the heel thing. Like that's why I don't wear heels because like. I feel like if I did wear, wear heels ever, like the same thing would be happening to me all the time. I'd be falling yeah. everywhere. Just kind of a class, especially on scaffolding. It's like, yeah, it, it, I mean, I can imagine it's hard, <laughs> but whatever. I, I looked good in my heels. I don't care. Whatever. <laughs> and I'm sure every stage makes it a bit different. Makes like the, yeah. the scaffolding a bit different. So totally, totally a whole new, like you have to learn how to climb the stairs. <laughs> exactly. And there were like ladders you had to climb. It was like a jungle gym. <laughs> what? Yeah. Getting a workout in while doing a show. <laughs> oh, seriously. Not, not kidding. you. It was, it was fun though. Who, who needs the gym at hotels? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then, uh, what's the, I, uh, what would your dream vacation be right now? If we could, if you could go anywhere in the world. Italy. <gasps> Italy. Yes. I was supposed to go in June and it didn't happen. So 
Uh, That's where I want to go right now. <laughs> Italy. <laughs> I just want to go like anywhere on a plane, honestly. <laughs> well, I'm about to go home to Kansas City to see my mom. So I'm going to go on a plane next Saturday, this coming Saturday. So I'm prepping myself. I took a yeah. COVID test last week. So, you know. It's like, also like a part of me like wants to be able to go on a plane and feel safe on a plane. <laughs> I know, I'm nervous about it, but apparently I'm flying, um, I think American or De Delta. And I think that they do the every other seat. So that makes yeah. me feel better. Yeah, that's what I flew home in June. And that's what yeah. I did. Yeah. And it was, it was an experience. Yeah, we'll it see. It pretty normal, but <laughs> then what's the first thing you're going to do once quarantine ends? Oh, book a vacation? To Italy. <laughs> To Italy. Yeah, I'm just gonna get out. I'm just gonna go. Right away. <laughs> I, and I might not come back. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <Please. laughs> I mean, I wouldn't maybe not come back. From yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, but like, I'd have to like somehow arrange to sneak my dog across the border. Oh yeah, well my dog has to come anywhere I go. So that might be complicated. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, but he's coming. Yeah. <laughs> he's little. And then what's the, uh, I mean, what do you think live theater will be like when it is able to come back eventually? I think it's going to be really, really joyful. I think everyone's going to cry a lot. I think, I think there are going to be a lot of tears, a lot of catharsis um, happening. Um, I, realistically, I think that it's going to be um, a staged process. Like, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of I think there are going to be a lot of pay cuts because there's no way that they're going to be able to pay the cast and crew and musicians what they've been paying them if they're going to be at half capacity. Um, so I think everyone's, I think the unions are going to have to make concessions on um, payments. I think actors are going to have to compromise a lot um, and, and crew and musicians. Um, I don't know if it's actually going to happen with those, those concessions, but um, I, I mean, otherwise I just, don't know how they're going to pay the rent of the theater um, and all the running costs and everything without skyrocketing the charging, the, the ticket costs even more, you know, because if you can't fill the theater at capacity, then you'd have to then charge double for every other seat, you know what I mean? So I think there's a lot of um, economics that are going to have to be worked out in order to bring it back. Not only safety precautions, I think it's going to be a lot of um, economics. And Broadway specifically, I don't think has the ability to put, to choose like one or two shows to put into maybe bigger theaters like they're doing with Six and on West End right now, so. Well, I don't think so either because, well, there are a lot of factors, but I think the biggest one is that we don't have the audience right now because yeah. this is an industry that depends on tourism. And until people feel comfortable coming to New York and getting on planes and coming here, and until travel bans are lifted, uh, especially international, yeah. there's just, there's not gonna be the appetite or the audience for live events until that is lifted. And I don't think that will be lifted really until a vaccine is in place. Mm -hmm. And that's a trusted vaccine too. So, you know, I think, I, I don't know, I'm hopeful it will come back in some capacity in the spring, but I'm wary about that being a reality. Um, I have a feeling it might be another year from now, at least, before, just because I feel like we need, real, for, it to re for it to return to in the capacity that it, it was functioning before COVID, I think it's gonna be like three years before it comes back to full capacity. And that's sad to say, but like, that's just me being realistic. Like after 9-11, it took four years to really get for things to resume. I mean, I know that was different and that was a terrorist attack and this is, you know, something totally different, but um, it takes time for people to feel comfortable coming back to the epicenter of a tragedy. And we were the epicenter of COVID-19. So it might take time for people to come back. Do you think virtual theater is gonna stick around? Cause it's been such a big thing during- I think, I think, it, I think it'll be a substitute for now. Um, I think that um, the biggest thing right now is how to pay artists because a lot of th stuff right now is like for charity and whatever. Um, and that's great. 
but at the same time, if it's going to be a substitute for a profession that is not for free, <laughs> um, then it needs to be um, regulated and monetized in a way that reflects the industry it's replacing. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, um, that comes down, and that comes down to, you know, licensing rights, and that comes down to having maybe a separate contract under. Um, under actors equity that's for virtual events you know for virtual payments you know i think that um that since that's becoming a reality we can't just have you know what does a lort theater pay it's not just that now it's like what do you pay for a zoom reading you yeah. know like you what can. is the payment structure what's the minimum payment for all these virtual events now that actors are now doing to subsidize you know, so I think that that's a big question right now because we, I think this is going to be something that continues and I think it will continue past COVID. Yeah. I think that we've now invented um, a kind of a new medium for theater throughout through this. And I think that that's great. You know, innovation comes out of tragedy sometimes and that's kind of what's happening right now. So I think, you know, post COVID, you know, it's, it's cool though. We have now more streaming of theater so people you know who can't come can see it and i think that's going to be an added revenue stream to theater so i think that now is the time to perhaps put in some regulations um so that moving forward once COVID is over we have this additional revenue stream for theater yeah i was going to say you brought up a good point like uh, maybe uh people won't like aren't willing to pay as much to see something virtual but like the audience becomes bigger when it's virtual exactly the virtual. reach is bigger so yeah. so say you're paying ten dollars per person you it's not only 1500 seats yeah. in the theater now it's thirty thousand yeah it's like now it's thirty it's, it's thirty thousand dollars per night that people are watching thirty thirty thousand people not 1500 which is what a theater can fit you're exactly right so like there is a way to scale that yeah, and still make just as much money to pay. Yeah. Yeah. Which is honestly amazing. I, yeah. I love it. Not having to, not having to travel to see something that you right. want. And then uh, lastly, have you been working on anything, whether it's theater related or not, that you'd want to promote? Sure. Um, yeah, I have several projects that I'm working on right now. Um, the first one is, um, well, I have this company called Empowered Voices that I actually started when I was doing um, If Then, one of the creative projects I had. Um, and we do sexual assault prevention for the military, for corporations, using theater as the driving force in the way that we teach. Um, so building on that for what's going on with COVID, I've, I've put together this four-part video series to help um, teachers think like actors when they're teaching on camera. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really like a cool um, thing. And I basically go through different acting um, theories and about, I talk about viewpoints. I talk about vocal expression. I talk about the, the technicalities of your camera and your lights. I talk about playing a character, all that stuff, because it's such a different, it's a, sh like, it's a shift the same way that I shifted from on stage to on camera. Yeah. Um, it's what a lot of, what a, a lot of teachers are going through of shifting from in-person classroom settings to um, on camera. And so I put together this little tutorial that is going to be posted on either Teachable or Podia, Podia, which are teaching platforms online. So, and it can be downloaded for $4.99 to watch all four videos. I love that. Yeah. So that's something I'm doing right now. Um, I'm also working on an album. Uh, Broadway Records is producing my album. Um, so I'm in the process right now of getting together all the songs with the songwriters and um, we're going to be recording at the Greenpoint Recording Collective in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. So we're going to be doing that. So I'll be posting more information um, about that once um, once all my ducks are in a row for, you know, doing like an official announcement about it. Um, so I'm doing that. And then I also have a screenplay in the works. Um, with um, Leah Thompson directing it from Back to the Future. Oh, and yeah. yeah, so working on that, um, uh, that's always, you know, a process and everything. But uh, yeah, so like lots of things going on, you know, you just have to. Yeah, you know, you're doing it, a lot in yeah. different areas too. Totally. I mean, I've always been somebody who sees how, you know, my work on stage is not just for the stage. 
it's for also other areas of life. And so I really am big about um, seeing, you know, how transferable things are into other aspects. I'm not like, I'm not like a linear person. I like to like go all yeah. over, but with the same umbrella idea of communication. What made you want to uh, make your own album? Because I feel like a lot of people on Broadway, like that, they have like that struggle of like, well, it's not a character, it's like my own thing. That used to be a thing for me, but I, I have two one woman shows. And I, so I, I kind of got over that pretty quickly <laughs> when you start putting together your own shows and things. Um, I just love to sing, you know, I love to tell a story through song and that's all it is. So, you know, it's personal and, um, yeah, I, I don't really care if I'm not playing a character anymore. It's kind of just like, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I have nothing to hide anymore. So, you know, and giving people good music to listen to. Yeah, it's music Important. and it's creative and it's, it's very, it's a, it's like a singer songwriting vibe, like pop singer songwriter. Um, but it has like, kind of like a like a Linda Ron Stat Melissa Manchester feel like you're way too young to know who that is but but it has like a cool like singer songwriter vibe like Sarah Bareilles in a way yeah yeah like Ooh, a more pop that. poppy more pop Sarah Bareilles yeah well I'm excited to hear it and yeah uh, it'll be it'll be really cool I'm excited yes and then uh to keep up with you and uh find out where to find this album and uh keep up with the screenplay you're working on etc where can people follow you on social media Sure. Um, so just at Janine DeVita on Instagram. Uh, and then my website is just JanineDeVita.com. Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining me again. Thanks for having me. This is oh, awesome. Lovely. I love what you're doing. And thanks so much for inviting me to talk with you. It's been awesome. Thanks for watching this episode of Backstage with Becca B. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Becca B Talks TV. Or for more exclusive content from this interview and more, you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Backstage with Becca B. Make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video, or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, go ahead and give me a five-star rating. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!